Welcome to this session. I want to show you what it looks like to use the Satoshi uh, client, uh, now called the Bitcoin Core client, uh, which is a wallet that you keep the rights to Bitcoins on your local machine. And I want to show you what that client looks like and some of the ways in which the Bitcoin infrastructure uh, influences what you see in that client. And then if all works well, I'm going to try and send and receive some Bitcoin from um, Coinbase, which is an online wallet service, just so you can see kind of what the process looks like and understand what's involved in, in, the, in the interchange. So the first thing, uh, let's look at an overview of what that's going to be. So first thing I want to do is orient everyone to the Satoshi Bitcoin client. Um, we're going to send the Bitcoins, we're going to watch the Bitcoins arrive, and then we're going to send the Bitcoins back to Coinbase. See how well this works. All right. All right, so first what I want to do is I want to fire up the Bitcoin client. This is the Bitcoin Core client. And here it is. So what, what we have here is we have a view of a Bitcoin wallet that is um, running on my local computer from which I'm recording this podcast. And this is the overview screen, as you can see up here. And on the overview screen, we have... Uh, a wallet which shows how much Bitcoin is available. We show a listing of recent transactions and notably you see something else going on right down here uh, which is indicated by this progress bar which says synchronizing with network. And what's happening right now is that the client is connecting via the peer-to-peer -peer network and it's trying to ask all the other peers on the network what the most recent blocks are uh, that have been accepted into the longest blockchain. And so the way that it does that is it um, can, there are various ways that you can set up the client. My client is going out to um, some particular places on the internet where people exchange their network location so that you can participate in this peer-to-peer -peer network, an IRC channel. And by hovering over this right here, you can see that I've got eight active connections to the Bitcoin, uh, to the, um, Bitcoin network. And if I pull up some information that's specific to a Mac, uh, what you can do is you can look in the activity monitor and down here at the bottom you can see things like this which show that my computer right now is connected to this computer right here and is sharing information about the Bitcoin network. I have eight of those so let's see they're, they're changing slowly but they do change so here's one, here's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight so this um, last one's connecting to someone's dynamic IP address and they, they come and go as the connections break and as other things are happening but they, but they tend to kind of once you find good connections they tend to kind of stay pretty well connected and each of those uh, computers are also connecting to other computers and forming this big mesh of computers that are all sharing uh, the blocks in the blockchain so this bar is as it's filling up is it's trying to get the most recent blocks in the blockchain and if we come over here and we look at this little refresh icon and hover over it, you can see that um, right now at this point in time, I've currently got 309,033 blocks in the blockchain. And hover again. And this represents, uh, it just went up a little bit, and this represents uh, blocks generated as of 47 hours ago. So the last time I updated my client, uh, I received all the blocks up to 48 hours ago. And so the transactions right here, the money in my wallet and then transactions only reflect the things that happened before 48 hours ago. And so what we're going to see is as we pull in these last blocks, uh, we're going to see that um, the synchronization comes up to date and I am now going to be at par with all of the other computers uh, that are on the Bitcoin network. Now many of these wallet clients, at least the initial ones that were created, also had the capability to do mining. So under cover, there is, um, under, behind the UI here, there's code that enables your machine to do mining. But most of that has been removed from the interface and in some cases removed from the code uh, entirely because mining has become such a high performance task that most people's computers, I think everyone's computers, that would be running an interface like this are never going to successfully mine a block. In fact, I think the current estimate is something like 36 years before you're actually going to successfully mine a block. Now mining a block right now would give you 25 bitcoins, which is pretty good. Bitcoins are trading at about $600 each um, today. Uh, so that would be great, but it's going to take you 36 years. So most of that's been removed. And so while I'm participating in watching those blocks be constructed, and I'm also participating when 
I find out that a block has been closed, I check to make sure that that nonce uh, successfully completes the signature for that block to make sure that the block is closed. So my client is participating in the network by validating all of the signatures that make the blockchain valid, uh, but it's not participating in trying to extend the blockchain. All right, so we come back here, and we're now up to 30 hours ago. So let me walk through some of the other things that are going on here. All right, so if you want to send Bitcoin, you activate this tab, um, and what you can do is you indicate the public address of the person to whom you would like to send Bitcoin to. And you, there's an address book here. Uh, so you can choose a previously listed address if there's someone that you regularly do uh, payments with. Uh, there's a clipboard here that enables you to paste an address from the clipboard. Because, you, because the payments, you can't get them back, you never want to make a typo. Because if you accidentally make a typo and it's a valid address, the money just goes away and there's no way you can get it back. So you have to be very, very careful about transcribing the addresses uh, to whom you want to send the Bitcoin. Um, and then lastly, this is to clear, clear an entry that you have. You can put a human readable label. This is just for you to keep track of the transaction. And then you can specify how much Bitcoin that you want to send here. Um, so if you want to receive Bitcoin, uh, you can do this. You can use this form here. And what you can use this for is requesting Bitcoin. And this doesn't actually pull money from anyone's account. But you can say, um, uh, um, you can say like Bitcoin for mowing the lawn, and let's say I'm going to charge someone half a Bitcoin for that, and please send it by Tuesday. Um, I I can specify which address I want to them to send it to, and I can request that payment and I pick which address I want them to send it to. Oh, um, I'll send it to this, this key here. Please send it to this address. And then when I request the payment, what I get from this is I get a window that indicates uh, uh, it's a QR code that people can use to automatically enter in the receiving address to which they should send my Bitcoin. So this doesn't do anything with the blockchain. Requesting payment like this is just about um, constructing a message that you can give to someone else so that um, they can enter it into their client and send you payment without making any typos or without making any mistakes. Um, so this is sort of like um, a convenient way of, cr of crafting an email that has all the information that someone needs in order to send Bitcoin to you. All right, so you could request that, but there's no binding uh, process. There's nothing that changes in the Bitcoin when this happens. All right. Okay. And then lastly, you can get a list of transactions. And so see, what you can see here is you can see that all of the transactions that have occurred, you can see several transactions over the last year or so that I've received. Um, several of them have come from mining operations, and then I have some uh, transactions that I've done with other people. How much Bitcoin is sent in that transaction? And this check mark indicates how many blocks have been constructed after the block in which this transaction exists. And, you, and what we use, this is a reflection of trying to make sure that there's been enough people that have agreed that a block has closed that you can safely um, consider that this transaction has been finalized. Um, initially, when your transaction gets included into a block, many people are trying to compete to close that block. Since not everyone has the same transactions that are in that block that they're closing, if two competing miners close blocks, one which does have your transaction and one which doesn't have your transaction, you don't want to deliver the goods or the services that someone paid you for until you're sure that your transaction was accepted by the community. And so the general rule of thumb is that in order to be very confident that your transaction has been accepted, you want to make sure that six blocks have been closed after the block in which your transaction has occurred. Now blocks tend to close about once every 10 minutes and so to get that level of confidence it's going to take about an hour. Um, depending on what you're delivering, what kind of goods or services you're involved in, uh, you may be not so worried about re receiving that much confirmation that um, your block has, your transaction has been included um, in the chain. Okay. All right. Um, so how are we doing now in our downloading of the chain? Uh, we've got 19 hours 
um, we're 19 hours behind the rest of the community. So while we watch that catch up, let's go take a look at some of the preferences to look under the covers. Oh, one thing I want to show you is I want to show you that we've talked about the way in which Bitcoin is capped at 21 million um, Bitcoins. And when we um, think about that, we know that over time, if the Bitcoin economy grows, that the value of a Bitcoin uh, should also grow because it's um, kind of a deflationary environment rather than the value of a Bitcoin decreasing, which would be an inflationary requirement. And so we know that over time, using Bitcoin might not be using Bitcoin as the unit of account may not be very helpful because it will be so large that uh, many transactions won't won't use that resolution. So, for example, here in my overview, my wallet currently has 1.5 Bitcoin. Today, Bitcoin's trading about $600 each, so this represents about $1,000 in U.S. Uh, currency. But what if I just want to send someone 25 cents in Bitcoin? Well, talking about it in this resolution might not help. And so you can change the resolution of your client. So you're talking about milli bitcoins or micro bitcoins. And when you do that, um, you can see that, oh, if you talk about micro bitcoins, then I have many, many more. And that's a way that you deal with the deflationary problem associated uh, with bitcoins raising in value over time. Currently, you're only able to get eight decimal places past um, the bitcoin, um, but that's something that could be changed pretty easily um, if there's consensus in the Bitcoin community to do that, if the big value of Bitcoin grew such that that made sense. Okay, catching up in the blockchain chain, we're 16 hours behind. Let's look at some of the preferences in the client. Okay, you have some basic stuff like being able to start the Bitcoin client when you log in, um, how big you want your database cache to be. The, the blockchain is kept in a database on your disk, and so there's a database cache that's kept in memory. Um, some information about ver how many threads you want to use to validate the blockchain. So how many computer processes you want running to validate the blockchain. Zero is a default, says let the computer pick for me. There's some specifications on the wallet. You can say how much of a transaction fee do you want to include in your um, transactions when you send money to other people. Um, if, it's, if it's higher than zero, then it's more likely that the miners are going to include that transaction in the block that they're trying to close because in addition to getting the reward for closing the block, they also get to take that transaction fee. So your, your transaction will, be get, will get preferential treatment from the miners if you include a transaction fee. For now, it's not necessary. Um, coin control features uh, enable you to specify which specific sources of Bitcoin, where you got, you, when you spend Bitcoin, you can say, I want to spend the Bitcoin that I re received from Bob. I want to send Bitcoin to Alice. I want to use the Bitcoin that I received from Bob to send to Alice, rather than just not worrying about where the money came from into your wallet. Um, network, there's some stuff about how you connect to the peer-to-peer um, -peer network. If you want to use some port matching capabilities, that's called UPnP. If you want to allow people to connect to you in order to get information from you to, so that they can figure out what the blockchain is. This requires you to not be behind firewalls or to have your firewall set up correctly so that people can connect to you despite them. Um, some information about proxy settings. And then lastly, for your display, you can specify the language. You can specify the default units that you want to use. Um, and then lastly, you can talk about whether or not you want to display um, addresses um, in the transaction list um, in various ways. Okay. All right. So then that's, that's, the, that's a basic overview to the client. Um, as these blocks come in, uh, the wallet should switch from being out of sync to being in sync, and the recent transaction should switch from being out of sync to being in sync because we received all the transactions that are on uh, the Bitcoin chain uh, currently.